100 years ago, traveling at 60 miles per hour seemed impossible. Now a car has smashed through the sound barrier at 763 miles per hour. Land speed racers risk their lives with every run. This is one of the most difficult and dangerous contests on Earth. Ever since the invention of automobiles, a select few racers have been obsessed with driving them to their limits. For the most daring, the land speed record has been the ultimate reward. The land speed record is actually one of the most fascinating and I think it's the most exciting thing you've done on God's Earth. I'm absolutely convinced of it. There are many different categories, but none has more glamour than the unlimited world land speed record. Once you fought through a land speed record effort and then been successful, um, everything by comparison becomes rather pale. Jet-powered cars are now unrivaled for speed, but this electric car represents the future. As soon as any new technology becomes available, there is always someone prepared to test its limits. Land speed records are nothing but adrenaline. Pat Rummerfield has triumphed over horrendous injuries to push the land speed record into the new millennium. The Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah have a long association with land speed racing. By the 1960s, the peaks surrounding Bonneville had begun to echo with the roar of exciting new technologies. This was a time of experimentation. The need for speed drove teams towards ever more extreme methods of propulsion. The power of the rocket proved phenomenal. But like a firework, once ignited, rockets cannot be turned off. It made them difficult to control, and they often caused serious damage to any machines they powered. Jet engines, by comparison, were easy to control. They could sustain high speeds and were much simpler to maintain. The new technologies were faster, but they could be lethal. In 1962, Glenn Leisher's car, Infinity, exploded mid-run, killing him instantly. He was not the first or the last to die. But nothing could deter the men who wanted to be the fastest on Earth. Hidden in a backyard workshop in California, an extraordinary machine was beginning to take shape. At only 25 years of age, its young designer had ambition and sponsorship to match. He'd grown up in awe of land speed legends like Malcolm Campbell and John Cobb, and was determined to get his own name in the record books. Craig Breedlove has been mad about cars since the age of 15. His need for speed was to change the land speed race forever. It's a car, believe it or not. In Los Angeles, Craig Breedlove unveils the spirit of America, his jet-powered three-wheel streamliner designed to go 500 miles an hour or more. 
Reed Lum will attempt to better the late John Cobb's 15-year-old mark of 394 miles an hour and bring home to America the world land speed record. All America is with you, Craig. Good luck. When Breedlove arrived at Bonneville in 1963, it was the start of a revolution. My uh, take on the thing was to pull it a little bit away from the automotive arena and bring more of the, the aircraft technology into it. The FIA, Land Speed's ruling body, refused to certify Breedlove's creation. It looked like an aeroplane, only had three wheels, and most shocking of all, its engine did not power the wheels directly. It was a pretty scary thing for me. Uh, at, I was uh, you know, 25 years old at the time. I'd never driven a, a jet engine car. Of course, not many people had. Spirit of America was a jet engine on wheels. Steering the car was an unnerving experience. It was pretty terrifying because we had devised a steering system for the car that consisted of differential braking of the two back wheels and um, a steering rudder. And uh, the, actually, the, the system didn't work. <laughs> So later the same season, Breedlove returned to the Salt with a modified Spirit of America. The addition of a tail fin made the car more stable. To get a record, a racer must drive through a measured mile both ways inside an hour. On August 5th, 1963, Craig Breedlove made a two-way average of 407.447 miles per hour. But the really good news came from the FIA. To accommodate Breedlove's new technological approach, the official ruling body agreed to create a new record category, the Land Speed Unlimited. It set off a blaze of competition. Once we had set the record, it kind of drew a whole bunch of people into it. And that's really when Arfons got involved. I only knew of him through his drag racing. In his cluttered backyard workshop in Ohio, Art Arfons has been building and racing dragsters for years. For Arfons, the legalization of jet engines was a dream come true. Even today, Arfons is obsessed with engines of all types, jet, prop, or piston. His skill in matching the right engine to the right car is legendary. Power has always been uh, the instigator of my getting involved. Back in the late 50s, jet engines were up for bid on a government auction. You could buy them for three or four and five hundred dollars. And uh, that's when I decided I wanted to put a jet in the car. In October 1964, Art Arfons arrived on the Bonneville Salt Flats behind the wheel of his own jet car, the Green Monster. Built from reconditioned parts and scrap metal, it cost a fraction of Breedlove's Spirit of America. But Arfons and the Green Monster were a formidable force, pushing the unlimited record even higher with a two-way average of 434 miles per hour. The adrenaline was addictive. Once you got the feel of going fast and accelerating, you can't give it up. I think I'm stuck with it forever. By taking Breedlove's record, Arfons had sparked the most hotly contested duel in land speed history. Well, obviously, he got my attention, and uh, we didn't know what Art's potential was. He certainly had a much more powerful engine than we had. 
Breedlove returned to Bonneville. The land speed was no longer just about men and their machines, but a battleground for manufacturing giants. It was not only the, the competition between the art and myself, but it was competition between Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company and Firestone, who were competing to have the fastest tire in the world. And, and so that, that provided the funding to enable us to do that. Without the sponsorship, uh, you know, we wouldn't have been able to, to go for it. Firestone took a big stake in Arfon's car. Goodyear sponsored Breedlove, who was determined to beat Arfon's and win back his land speed crown. He had been the first over 400 miles per hour. Now he wanted to be the first past 500. It's been 35 years since Craig Breedlove almost died at this exact spot at Bonneville. On October 15, 1964, he fired up Spirit of America to retake the world record. Breedlove was about to become the luckiest man alive. By increasing his power setting for the return run, Craig knows that he is within reach of an over 500 mile an hour record. What he doesn't know is that this is going to be the wildest ride of his life. It was the return run of an official record attempt, and he was flying. Good looking good. Here he comes. Moving fast. He's looking good. He's roaring. He cleared the measured mile with a new world record of 526 miles per hour. Then everything went wrong. Something came off of the car. He lost his chute. He lost his chute. Seconds later, Breedlove's emergency parachute also failed. He's going too fast for his brakes to hold. He's out of control. I was coming from the speed course down behind me, and I was still well over 300 miles an hour. He's really moving. And my problem was is that the closer and closer I got to this row of phone poles, the closer and closer they got together. I got to the point where I was thinking, God, I just hope I can get the nose of the car between two of them. He narrowly missed the first set of telephone poles at over 300 miles per hour. There was no way to slow down, and suddenly there was a second set of poles. I knew it was going to be quite a collision. I mean, this is a substantial object. And it just went bang like that. And there was just no phone call. As Breedlove's team raced to his aid, Spirit of America careened on, plowing through an embankment and pitching into the saltwater pond on the other side. Once I hit this embankment, it shot the nose of the car up into the air, and, and this is at a speed well over 200. The car hit the water and skipped one time, just like a stone, and then the next time it hit, it just grabbed onto it, and of course the nose went right under. That hole just steered off like nothing, you know, boom, and no ball. And I thought, oh boy, another chance, and I looked out. <laughs> I hit the water, and that water started slowing me down. I seen this big old bank coming, I thought, oh, no. I was just almost giddy with joy because I had basically just written my life off. I mean, I, I thought, you know, this this is it. I'm not going to get out of this scrape. I'm getting the canopy off and trying to get my belt on. I couldn't get my mask off, and the water was filling up like that. I thought, what a way to go. All this stuff going to drown. <laughs> I saw my dad come and saw, you know, guys I'd gone to school with, everything, and uh, it was a pretty high time. We had the record, wrecked the car, but, uh, you know, it was a good day. To break the world record, he had almost paid the ultimate price. Really, you're on your own. If there's no one that can help you in any kind of an emergency. It's really up to you and the machine and the circumstance. 
as, as to how you're going to survive. Just two weeks after Breedlove almost died regaining his crown, Arfons took the record back. Breedlove wasted no time. Only 13 months after the crash, he rolled a brand new Spirit of America out onto the Bonneville Salt Flats. The new car was big on investment and technology. The world held its breath as Breedlove and Arfons dueled on the salt. Over the next two weeks, they drove their machines to greater and greater speeds. The only limit was how far they dare push themselves. Finally, Breedlove became the first official record holder to reach 600 miles per hour. A new page for the record book, and a new entry for the special page that belongs to Craig Breedlove. Then, at the height of the duel, Arfon's luck finally ran out. Arfon's himself had seen it coming. I had a premonition. I, uh, I had seen myself crash. And then it made me a little more apprehensive. You know, when I got in the car, when I started the engine, I didn't worry about it at all. Arfons entered the measured mile at breathtaking speed, easily the fastest any car had ever been. But the stress on the car was too much. Seconds after leaving the starting line, disaster struck without warning. Incredibly, Arfons was cut from the wreckage alive. He'd survived a crash at an amazing 610 miles per hour. I never knew it was going over. It, you know, I lost the front wheel and it dug in and did a flip and went 527 feet before it ever hit the ground again. It's a long way to throw a three-ton car. It was the highest speed crash ever survived on land. But as Arfons was stretchered away, his only concern was for his beloved car strewn in pieces across the salt. It's almost like it was a child belonged to me. I uh, really had an attachment to the car. And it sure hurt when I seen it all wadded up in the pile of junk. Uh, it's like losing a child. With the death of the green monster, Art Arfons never again attempted the unlimited land speed record. It marked the close of the greatest battle in the sport's history. But the jet engine was here to stay. It would be another 18 years before a jet car retook the unlimited record. For Richard Noble, the record was as much about national pride as personal ambition. What had happened is, um, really, since uh, Donald Campbell in 1964, um, Britain had just run away from the land speed record. The Americans had now increased the land speed record uh, by 50%, and uh, the Brits did a very British thing and tried to pretend it never happened. You know? <laughs> With its side-mounted cockpit and a single jet engine, Noble's thrust, too, bore a passing resemblance to Art Arfon's famous Green Monster. But the car's solid aluminum wheels slid all over the salt surface. Noble's record attempts at Bonneville were hopeless. It was at Black Rock Desert in Nevada that his fortune would change. When Noble first set eyes on the dry baked surface, he knew he'd found the perfect ground for his car. On October 4th, 1983, he realized a childhood dream. It was an extraordinary experience, absolutely extraordinary. With your right foot, you slam accelerate right down to max burner, max power, and, um, and then suddenly this huge afterburner lights you, an enormous flame, and you're off. And between naught and uh, 350 miles an hour, the car's all over the place.
as they start to come up to um, 650, which is the fastest I ever got to, the extraordinary thing is that your mental processes are, t are turning over very, very fast indeed. So everything is happening in slow motion. go through the measured mile and then the fun starts because then you've got to stop. You see, you're losing speed at about 130 miles an hour per second. And what actually happens is that the inner ear can't cope with this. It's called the somatographic illusion. And you get the impression firmly that the whole world is just doing that and you're driving vertically into the, into the desert. Richard Noble broke the land speed record with a two-way average of 633 miles per hour and took the title record back to Britain for the first time in nearly 20 years. But Noble's next car was to make Thrust 2 seem like a toy. Yeah.